Today we're grading the brown rat. Team cows, team rodents. Every level except for ice level. Global domination range, but the OGs are from somewhere in China. Back in the day, dinosaurs ruled planet Earth until they all got murked in a cataclysmic event. The brown rat was like, miss me with that asteroid shit. I'm about to take this entire planet over. They did. Humans didn't even know about rats until the Middle Ages. But brown rats always knew about humans. They knew if they wanted their rodent enterprise to grow at scale, they needed to infest heavily into human society. The thing about brown rats is they're really smart. They're able to run mazes, figure out puzzles, and once a small group of brown rats even developed a plague that almost took out the entire human race. Humans and rats are almost tied for who's the most successful modern animal. Let's compare. Taking care of their sick and injured. Rats, check. Humans, check. Take showers and keep somewhat clean. Rats, check. Humans, check. Will snitch on their homies to get out of trouble. Rats, check. Humans, check. Males can ejaculate multiple times in a row, machine gun style, for maximum female impregnation. Rats, check. Humans, eh. Every day, every single animal on Earth tries to kill the brown rat. And the brown rat's like, that's cool. We got nuked by God day one. You think you're gonna make a dent? 2020 year of the rat A+. Today, we're grading Baird's Beaked Whale. Team Whales, Team Beaked Whales, Team Beaked Whales again, because on the down low, we don't know shit about them and made an extra category. Ocean level, Arctic, Russian, Canadian, Alaskan, Japanese, North Korean, deep sea oceans. You never hear about beaked whales, even though there's a whole gigantic whale team of beaked whales, bigger than killer whales, but smaller than baleen whales that have crocodile snaggle teeth. I'm using a painting of Baird's beaked whale. Wikipedia had this grainy bullshit drawing of Baird's beaked whale with a guy trying to fuck it. I'm sorry. I'm probably the world's best animal scientist, and I can't tell you shit about this animal. Because when I'm doing my scientific research of stealing footage of animals off the internet, it looks like nobody has any HD stock footage of Baird's Beaked Whale. The thing about Baird's Beaked Whale is they're record-holding deep-sea divers, able to run the bottom of the sea relay in 138 minutes. And to reduce drag, they even evolve little pockets to hide their flippers in. Okay. I was able to find this picture of some Japanese guy making whale head sashimi, but Getty Images is saying $500 for this image, and $500 for this one, $500 for this one with little kids for some reason. Should I do a GoFundMe to finish this episode correctly? How many chopped up Baird's beaked whale pics do I have to buy to make up one whole whale? Makes me really admire the homie Spencer Fullerton Baird, the 1800s animal scientist, original curator at the Smithsonian, founding member of the American Ornithological Union, AKA Bird Club, even had a dildo hipster beard 130 years before his time. He discovered and named Baird's beaked whales. How did he even find them? In the 1800s, you could still get a job where you go out on a boat and try to kill a whale by hand. Listen, first rule of grading animals is you gotta show up to class. And if you miss too many classes, and you can't go to animal school. So I'm sorry, Baird's beaked whale, but you're getting an incomplete this semester. Today we're grading the ocelot. Team lions, team meow cats, jungle level, central and South American jungles. It's cool to imagine the ocelot in the jungle, climbing trees, hunting iguana, meowing loudly, pretending to be a big cat, but really they're trying to avoid alligator, anaconda, puma, jaguar, and harpy eagles who are all dying for a taste of that sweet little pussy. The thing about ocelots is that they love to eat monkeys. Inside of every cat's heart is the desire to kill a human. And if you can't get a human, you might as well kill the next best thing, which is a monkey. My fellow scientists and I set up infrared cameras to spy on ocelots and found that they piss and shit in the same designated areas. So even in the wild, cats use litter boxes. And yeah, we were looking at ocelots pissing and shitting. And it was for science, okay? It's illegal to have ocelots as pets. Are they dangerous? I mean, an ocelot wouldn't kill you. Hopefully, it would only just kill your child. B minus. Today we're grading the aardwolf. Team cows, team lions, team hyenas. I mean, team aardwolves. Savannah level, east and south coast Africa. Team Hyenas was all about eating dead animals, trying to kill everything that moves, biting each other's face off, having a pseudo penis, shout out history hyenas. But 10 million years ago, one hyena was like, nah, I'm good. From here on out, I think I'll eat termites. Africa has an extreme termite problem. That's why aardvarks, anteaters, pangolins, and aardwolves banded together to take out the termites. Who left this huge job to these little varmints? They aren't even making a dent in the termite situation. The thing about aardwolves is they fuck between one and five hours straight. 
So let's say on average, they fuck two and a half hours at two pumps a second. That's 18,000 pumps. At an hourly pump interest rate of 4%, you're looking at a pump to bust ratio of 20,000 pumps over a three hour period. Ardwolves mark their territory 20 times a night with their special double asshole gland. They also have an asshole on their paw, somewhere near their dick hole, and another bonus asshole to be determined. Basically, Ardwolves are constantly oozing stinky shit pus out of various holes to warn you not to go near their territory. Yo, nobody's going near your termites, relax. I get having a stupid day job as a termite hunter so you don't have to go out and be a real hyena, but at the same time, Ardwolf, you're gonna go extinct one day. Is this really how you wanna spend your life? D minus. Today we're grading the Red Panda. Team Red Panda, Jungle Lion, Red China. The Red Panda does not fit in with the current classification system of animal teams. What we know so far is that they have nothing to do with pandas, they have nothing to do with bears, they have nothing to do with raccoons, and they aren't now, nor have they ever been members of the Communist Party. Red Pandas are the only animal not on Team Monkey who can tell the difference between sugar and sweet and low. Yo, Red Panda. Why bother learning that? Big, big problem in the red panda community is inbreeding. Red pandas breed successfully in zoos, but the zoos don't let them get away with any funny business. Look in the eyes of this red panda. You got to admit, it's a very fuckable animal. As of this recording, we now know there's two distinct species of red pandas out there, Muppet style and Pokemon. But if you want my expert opinion, I wouldn't water them or feed them after midnight. B plus. Today we're grading the Deep Sea Isopod. Team Crustacean, Team Crust Punk Station, Ocean Level, Worldwide Baby. The thing about the Deep Sea Isopod is it's identical to your standard roly-poly, AKA pill bug. And the thing about the pill bug is because it eats dead rotting shit all day, it absorbs poisons, leaving your soil and groundwater mad clean. Lesson here is that even if you're a disgusting piece of shit like the deep sea isopod pill bug, you can still do something nice for society. If you're a bug on dry land, I will stomp you to death on sight. But if you're the exact same bug but live underwater, I'll fuck with you. That's the grading animals double standard guarantee. Isopods come in different sizes. You got the isopod classic, isopod nano, isopod touch, isopod red, and the giant deep sea isopod pro. After girl isopods molt, they're like one big soft titty. And the boy isopods tear off one of their dicks and jam them USB style anywhere on the girl isopod, where she then downloads the spermies into her egg pouch. I don't understand why humans can't fuck like that. B plus. Today we're grading the lynx. Team cats, team meow cats, team lynx cats. Forest level, north ass forests of the globe. While lions and tigers got famous off their size, looks, and nonstop stunting, it backfired. Because lions and tigers are both basically extinct. Meanwhile, the lynx, who never tried to go all Hollywood, is basically not extinct. But even though the northern hemisphere is stuffed with lynx, you never see these cats because they only lurk in the shadows of the darkest parts of the forest. The unique looking cats got long back legs, ear tufts, fat paws, dark tail, mutton chops, yeah, that's what a lynx looks like. Caracal, serval, jagarundi, palace cats, they're not lynxes, they're copycats. The thing about lynx is the kittens can vary wildly in color, which is a real convenience for all the promiscuous lynx moms out there fucking around behind their man's back. Cat lovers, think your pet kitty can befriend a lynx? Think again. A lynx will leave your little pussy looking like it needs a box of Kotex Heavy Flows. The lynx is practically impossible to observe because it can detect the presence of man the moment he steps into the forest. And since I tagged the lynx in this video, anyone who watches this will never see a lynx in the wild. Well done, lynx. A minus. Today we're grading the Mega Mouth. Team Sharks, Team Megamouth Sharks, Ocean Level, Allegedly Mad Oceans. The Megamouth Shark is a glow-in-the-dark mouth deep sea alternative shark in the mackerel shark family. You know, the same family that got the great white sharks, mako sharks, thresher sharks, basking sharks, sand tiger sharks, and other sharks that I don't have toys of. Just like the whale shark and the basking shark, the Megamouth is one of these swim with your mouth open all day trying to blow plankton sharks. The thing about the Mega Mouth Shark is it's only been seen 100 times since 1976, or once every 160 days. 
So it's possible that the Megamouth shark is just one shark swimming around trying to go viral. In 1990, a Megamouth was tagged with a radio tracker. We found out it swims very slowly, very fatly, very lazily, and very dumbly. And in none of our findings did the Megamouth ever say shit back to us. Where's your Megamouth now, bitch? Honestly, until some 4K deep sea footage comes out of you doing your glowing mouth stunt, you can get the fuck out of my school along with Baird's Beaked Whale, where you can both get reclassified as sailor's myths as far as I'm concerned. Failure for non-attendance. And everyone, please vote in the comments for what animal should get to take Megamouth's place and why. Today we're grading the mosquito. Disgusting piece of shit beetle team, fly team, pond level, but all they need is a teaspoon of water to multiply exponentially anywhere it isn't freezing. Yeah, let's just get that out of the way first. Mosquitoes spread some of the most devastating viruses on earth, including malaria, elephantitis, Zika, West Nile, chikungunya, and dengue virus. Dengue. They never figured out how to transmit AIDS. And believe me, it hurts their feelings when you remind them. Thing about mosquitoes is the females do all the blood sucking. And they don't just bite, they have a labium, basically a mouth labia that they mush into the skin to get a nice wet suction before jamming the blood straws in. And the labium juices trick the immune system because the immune system's like, I'm getting malaria, but I'm also getting pussy, what do I do? Female mosquitoes suck blood because they need it to make eggs, but also, a lot of female mosquitoes actually enjoy sucking blood. Guy mosquitoes don't suck blood and most of them don't even eat. They just fly around using their food reserves they had from being a larva. The annoying ass buzzing wing sound the guys make is actually a bug wave radio signal that girl mosquitoes can sign into and use similar to Bumble. Mosquitoes live three to five days top, so it's a real simple life. Mosquitoes also bite spiders, cicadas, caterpillars, all animals who don't even have blood, but bug goo instead. Mosquitoes are like, whatever you got inside of you, I will suck it out. Honestly, fuck mosquitoes. But thanks for breaking us off a little every time you infect us. F plus. Today we're grading the D-hole. Team dog adjacent, team obsolete wolf, triple citizenship for jungle level, mountain level, and plains level, Himalaya, Indonesia, and China to the Koreas. When I saw this animal, I was like, D-hole? Why not lion coyote? I immediately wrote an email to noted animal scientist and animal namer, Spencer Fullerton Baird, and asked him why it's called that. And his letter said, my dearest J-caps, Unlike good dogs whose skulls are convex, the d hole's skull is concave. Because over millennia, anyone dealing with this fake-ass dog smacked it in the head. Evolution did the rest. But it's named D-Hole, because the dog's a fucking D-Hole. All the best, Spencer Fuller's in bed. The thing about D-Holes is that they do handstands while they piss. So it's very likely the first person who identified a D-Hole identified it by its D-Hole. Turns out, D-Hole was an original OG dog and even joined the dog pound before dogs were called dogs on some fossil record shit. But then wolves came out and everyone was like, now we're talking, wolves are the best. D-Holes not only got downgraded, but eventually kicked off the dog team and are now known as old timey farm league dogs who they don't even invite to dog team meetings. D-Hole, D-Hole. I'm not giving an A-hole to a D-hole. Today we're grading the California Condor. Team Clawbirds, Team Eagles, Go Birds. Mountain level, a couple neighborhoods in California and Arizona. Cali Condor looks like if you had your ball sack on the front of your dick, and every night you jerked off with 80 grit sandpaper. But a condor's day to day is going neck deep into decomposing buffalo ass pussy. So obviously their face looks like shit. Back when mammoths, dire wolves, American camels, saber-toothed tigers, and my favorite, giant beaver roamed America, the Cali condor used to eat all their rotting entrails coast to coast. The thing about the California condor is it's the largest land bird on Earth. I think. It goes extinct like every other day. The wandering albatross is just waiting in the cut for this guy to drop dead to take the number one spot. Main reason Cali condors died out is from lead poisoning from dead animals who were shot. Also, eating glass, drinking antifreeze, and other jackass-type stunts. For a vulture whose whole thing is eating rancid, decaying carcasses, how do you turn around and go extinct from a tummy ache? Nowadays, all condors wear number tags because humans force them to speed date, but they've been fucking again. So now there's about 300 Cali condors left. While they had an extreme run and outlasted all their prehistoric amigos, most likely they'll go extinct again. But the ancients say the California condor will rise up cut off the heads of the humans and drain our blood so it floods the earth. 
And while I'm not into goth shit, I accept mythology as extra credit and will bump their grade up to a C. Today we're grading the Barracuda. Team normal looking fish, basic ass fish, ocean level, mad oceans. Everybody nonstop sucks off sharks, how they did 40 years of summer blockbusters scaring the shit out of people with their fin. Meanwhile, when Barracuda come up, they're like, so they bit a diver's hand off spilling pints of his blood 50 feet underwater. Who fucking cares? But remember, it wasn't sharks, but a Barracuda who whacked Finding Nemo's mom. The thing about barracudas is they have a huge underbite. Anybody who walks around with an underbite like that's gotta be a truly insane motherfucker. Great barracuda are loners, but when they're young bucks, they run in pack formation and sometimes get attacked by sharks, who obviously still dunk on them whenever possible. While they'll only horribly maim you in a fight, their flesh has cigatera, so if you eat them, at least they'll kill you that way. And they smell like shit. A minus. Today we're grading the killer whale. Team whales, team dolphins, ocean level, every single ocean known to man. Killer whales are psychopaths. They'll eat a baby whale's face and let it bleed out right in front of the mom. They'll kill a leopard seal just to flick its dead body out of the water like seal corpse water polo. They can hypnotize great white sharks and eat their livers while they're still alive. And those were only the murders they claimed on their first record. The thing about killer whales is they don't just swim in the ocean. They routinely travel miles up the Thames, Rhine, Elbe, Colorado, Oregon, and mad other freshwater rivers in order to take out motherfuckers who snitch. In fact, the only reason killer whales don't fuck with humans is because they use sonar and found out that we have operational nuclear submarines. After humans and brown rats, killer whales are the most successful, widely distributed mammals on the planet. Pretty good for an animal who at face value is just a fat ass Oreo cookie dolphin. A plus. Today we're grading the Kingfisher. Tweety Bird Team, International Consortium of Kingfishers. River Reeds level, Rolling Hills and Meadows level two. These little guys are doing pretty well for themselves. When you think of birds at the top of the food chain, you probably think eagle or some raptor wave bird. But this puffy little squirt held top spots as a veteran dive bomber for 40 million years. They have no real predators but 500% of kingfishers drown themselves trying to go too hard on their death from above flying attacks. Kingfisher nests are filled with coughed up balls of fish bones and piles of their own shit. They're gross. I mean, don't forget, bird flu comes from birds. The thing about kingfishers is their perfect vision. They see in 12K OLED color. They have polarizers to cut through pond glare, an industrial grade three axis gimbal neck, and built in swim goggles to protect those beautiful rosewood brown eyes. A kingfisher could stab you through the brain with its beak if it needed to. And maybe that's why they're not getting above ground drift netted like European songbirds. Truth be told, most kingfishers don't know how to do Top Gun style diving inversions. Most species just hang in the forest eating bugs. Salute. They only live 15 years, but honestly, who doesn't want to check out early sometimes? B. Today we're grading the wibbly wobbly wibbly wobbly wobby gong. Wibbly wobby gong. Team sharks, also team sharks, reef level sharks, Indonesian rain sharks, willoughby wallagogs, woolly gosnoggles, wop wibbly gong goslas, all words that mean douchey hipster beard in native Australia. But the shark known as the wibbly wobbly gong just lays around getting high off anemones hoping to fool a damselfish into getting eaten. The thing about wabigongs and all carpet sharks is that they have spiracles. And if you're a shark and you're still rocking spiracles, the news flash. When people are talking about sharks, they're not talking about you. They're talking about sharks. Why doesn't the wibbly wobbly gong do like its cousin the whale shark, also a carpet shark who had the insight and motivation to become the biggest fish of all time, instead of laying around evolving into a coral? Wobby Gong, if you'd just taken the plea deal and let us know the other members of your Wobby Gang, all this shit goes away. But as it stands now, D. I would have given you a B minus if you were honest with yourself and admitted you were trying to be a Ray this whole time. Think I wasn't gonna call you on that? Wobby, calling animals on their natural behavior is the central gimmick of this account. Wibbly -wobbly. Today, we're grading the Coast Redwood. Team Cypress, Team Sequoia, foggy coastal forests of the Pacific West Coast, baby. Coast redwoods are the largest and oldest living things of all time. They grow 200 to 375 feet, 
So, grower and shower. Host redwoods have been on this giant tree shit for 240 million years, back in Pangaea, when the continents were all together like an unfucked with Rubik's Cube. Even though they were around at the same time, coast redwoods didn't give a shit about dinosaurs. That whole thing was whack to them. Dinosaurs, prehistoric megafauna, you gotta remember, this is a 400 foot tree that's 5,000 years old. They got shit to do. Humans have only been around for 200,000 years and only started completely wiping coast redwoods off the face of the earth in the 1860s. They did not see that coming. You gotta think, Coast Redwood survived the asteroid, so you win some, you lose some. They're fire resistant. They even set fires to kill rival trees. And you know their scientific code name is Semper Viernis. They blaze that evergreen. Hmm. They actually need fire to live. Unless their seeds get blazed up in a forest fire. I can't get born. It's getting hot and so hot, so take off all your clothes. I am getting so hot, I wanna bust my suit out. Coast redwoods also snort fog water right out of the clouds, which allows them to get five times higher than other trees. They're the second biggest tree next to their evil half-brother, the giant sequoia. But the giant sequoia's wood sucks dick, and it's only good for making zillions upon trillions of toothpicks. Meanwhile, redwood is kinda indestructible. You think about coast redwoods living forever, enormous as fuck, and then you think about all these tiny ass underachiever trees. Like none of you guys are gonna even try to challenge a throne? Walnut tree's not doing anything. Willow tree's still crying in the corner. Rubber tree? What the fuck are you even doing, rubber tree? The coast redwood does not make paper. Thank God, dude. What do you want me to read a book that's 12 feet high? The redwood is used for many kinds of things, but the bark, the bark, the bark is so useful for insulation. Back in the day, heat it up, keep your house warm. All kinds of filling, the bark, the bark, the bark. Even though they're almost 100% gone, they still had one of the sickest runs of all time. 4.0, summa cum mad hard, gold star, honor roll, merit award, goat, and the Orlando Bloom Commemorative Trophy for Enormous Wood. This episode is brought to you by John Muir, the guy who convinced the people from Tumbleweed Times to stop raping each other in the face for two seconds and appreciate nature. And from Double Cobra Milling, the guy who sponsored the Dick Dick video. And from Richard Powers, The Overstory. This book rocks. I guess I really fuck hard with trees now says Jonathan Kaplan, creator of Grading Animals with J-Caps. And from viewers like you. Today we're grading the banyan tree. Team Mulberry, Team Fig, Southeast Asia. Most trees have to do all this extra shit to get their seeds planted. Helicopter seed pods, dropping seeds in the ocean, wishing well style, arson. But the banyan tree was like, I will fucking kill a tree with my bare branches before I ever try to get planted. So the Banyan developed a three-phase plan. Phase one, Banyan finds a local band of wasps, which they sign to an exclusive contract where they can only use Banyan figs for their gross bug parasite shit. In return, the wasps only pollinate Banyan flowers, honeybee style. Trees have to figure out creative ways to plant their seeds and fuck themselves. Once the banyans are pregnant, they start growing figs. Phase two. Then the banyans get all the animals in the forest addicted to their figs. Not telling them the figs are filled with waspages and eating them will make them shit immediately. Phase three. All of the trees in the forest have been shitted on. Inside of the shit balls, a little baby banyan seed is growing. When it pops out, it starts reaching its little baby seed roots to the ground. Once they touch ground, the little baby roots get jacked and multiply into millions of branches that strangle every tree that got shit on to death. The thing about trees is they don't move fast. Like if a bird shit a banyan seed on me, I just wipe it off, it'd be good luck, you know? But for a tree, it's like the minute that little banyan root hits the ground and starts snorting up those minerals, AKA plant food, it's a wrap. Grown up banyans just link branches and start walking outward in every direction. Trees just die inside of them, leaving hollowed out trunk relief sculptures. And nobody says shit, because every toucan, fruit bat, and gibbon in town is still getting paid off in Fig Newtons. Even Buddha got got by banyan trees. And before he got choked out, he was like, honestly, I'd rather be hanging from a mountain with a tiger under me eating a strawberry, but who's complaining? When legendary poet John Milton blind freestyled Paradise Lost to his daughters, 
He made Adam cover his big, huge dick and Eve cover her juicy, hairy pussy with banyan leaves. John Milton did it to show respect to banyans and also keep with the oppressive censorship culture of the time. Banyans are undefeated against all trees in their climate zone and have been known to go invasive and take out pine trees. Banyan, you came on the scene and fucked up the rules of what a tree even is. But you'll never be apple tree, orange tree, banana tree, peach tree, lime tree, maple tree, no matter how many times you strangle those trees to death. C minus. Today we're grading the Portuguese man o' war. Team ocean slimes, team nonsensical floating bullshit, ocean level, floating around tons of oceans. Portuguese man o wars are not one animal, but various separate ocean slimes who float around stinging animals with their 200 feet of ultra poisonous silly string. One slime is the bubble, one slime is the stomach. There's even some slimes doing administrative work. One slime is in charge of fucking, using mitotic fission, polyps, asexual budding, and other impossible to jerk off to forms of sex. They only live one year, if you consider drifting around the ocean with zero consciousness living. The thing about the Portuguese man o' war is they're named after 17th century battleships. But up close, they're very disappointing, and I think they should be renamed Stinging Sea Garbage. One hero of the ocean who kills these things is the sea slug. And it's weird because you'd think snot would get along with slime. But the number one predator is the loggerhead sea turtle. And I gotta admit, I should have done this episode about him. Portuguese mano stings won't kill you, but it will give you lifelong physical and mental problems. If you get stung, the only treatment is for everyone on the beach to just marinate you in piss. And just to be safe, get some people to shit on you too. Why this thing gets to be considered an animal and a tree can't be an animal is what's really wrong with this country. And I want to apologize to some of the bugs out there. I didn't realize this was going on, and I want to make it clear. I don't like you guys. But this Portuguese man o' war bullshit has got to stop. A clear F, save the turtles. Today we're grading the Goliath bird eater. Team spiders, team tarantula, jungle level, Amazon-ish jungles. The Goliath bird eater is the biggest tarantula on earth. One foot leg span, weigh half a pound, dual retractable raptor talons on the end of its paws, gigantic fangs strong enough to drill through mouse skull, and while their venom won't kill you, their bite just feels like getting shot with a nail gun. Mostly, the Goliath bird eater eats lizards, mice, worms, and other bugs, which is tight. <laughs> the only bird it ever ate was a hummingbird, a bird who thinks it's a bug. They can't see, smell, or hear. Using only their ultra-sensitive pubic hair to pick up vibes, they creep around, hoping to bump into an animal who's extremely not paying attention. The thing about Goliath bird eaters is the females live up to 25 years. They're also one of the few spiders who don't kill the guys right after sex. But male spiders still die after three years because the only way the females can come is from role-playing attempted murder scenarios. Their number one predator is the tarantula hawk, a classic parasitic scumbag wasp who just decimates these furry guys. It's sad to see. This bug is doing the type of evil shit I thought the tarantula was bringing to the table. The Goliath bird eaters got me afraid to even look in the direction of the Amazon. I'm even laying off full bush porn in case it's one of these spiders. A minus, just stay the fuck away from me. Today we're grading the Asian giant hornet. Team Horrible Piece of Shit Beetles, Team Flies, Forest Level, Forests of Asia. This is the world's biggest hornet, and hornets are wasps, one of the world's most evil animals. A wasp's signature move is injecting their larvae into living animals and letting the babies eat their way out alien style. Hornets don't even do that. They build a cubicle and serve a queen like drone-ass bitches. Since making landfall in Vancouver, people have been calling them murder hornets. In the 1980s, when the Frankenstein superhybrid Africanized honeybee, aka Killer Bee, went invasive, people also hyped the shit out of their murdering abilities. And it took 40 years, but it has killed about a thousand people and several horses, which is pretty cool. But none of these media hype bugs will ever put up numbers like the mosquito, who kill a million people a year every year. That being said, these guys are pretty mean to bees. They do ISIS-style head-chopping maneuvers to thousands of bees at a time for no reason. 
When these hornets attack Asian bees, the bees surround the hornet and create enough heat so the hornet gets vaped. American bees don't know that trick. But since bees communicate through dancing, why don't we just show American bees some Asian bee TikToks so they know how to fight back? These bugs think they're gonna destroy our native bee population. Uh, we have something called the American logging industry clear-cutting the last 2% of forests, and that's courtesy of our very own murder wasps who run the show here. See if they're hiring. Today we're grading the Ginkgo Biloba. Team Ginkgo fight, Team Ginkgo. Tiny part of China, but spread out everywhere. Ginkgo biloba are extremely old school dioecious trees. That means male and female trees sold separately. Who debuted in the post fern wave dino core scene. According to legend, long ago, the ginkgo fights flourished in harmony. Then everything changed when Ice Age came out. And when the world needed them most, they vanished. A thousand years ago, some Chinese monks discovered a new ginkgo fight a maidenhair tree named ginkgo biloba. And while its herbal tea skills are great, their fruit smells like shit. But I believe ginkgo biloba can cure Alzheimer's. The thing about ginkgo trees is they don't use pollen, and they sure as hell don't use birds and bees as pollinators. They consider that wearing a condom. Instead, ginkgo trees use 100% real sperm. Male flowers bud and slice open their nut sacks, letting their flying sperms raw dog the atmosphere. At the same time, girl trees are just getting gooey thinking of all those airborne cum loads. Once the girl tree captures a good spermie in her goo droplet, she dumps her unfucked ovules on the ground and takes a nap. In summertime, she makes eggs and wakes up the spermie who's just been marinating in her ovule. And the sperm gets so psyched that it realizes I'm actually two sperms now. And that's the part I usually start with at treepornhub.com. Fertilized ginkgo fruits smell like fresh vomit. That's why ginkgo trees were planted all over Manhattan, to complement the city's natural bum shit smeared on the sidewalk aroma. Ginkgo extracts have been used in traditional medicine for hundreds of years, but clinical studies are like, it's useless, bro. What we do know is side effects will include vomiting, diarrhea, nausea, dizziness, headaches, diarrhea, your shit's gonna get wrecked. These trees live 3,000 years and are insanely tough. There's ginkgo trees still kicking it today who took the Hiroshima A-bomb right to the chops. What tree you think the iguana who grew up to be Godzilla was holding on to? A plus. Today we're grading the moose. Deer team, even numbered hoof bracket, forest level, north ass forests of the world. Moose are the largest, heaviest, and most brolic of all deer. Moose are gigantic. Alaskan and Siberian moose stand seven and a half feet at the shoulder and have dicks anywhere between 11 and 16 inches. Soft. And while I'd love to spend the entire episode laser focused on moose cock, we have a real fucking problem. And I can't believe it hasn't been ironed out before. In North America, we call moose, moose. But in England, they call moose, elk. Are you following me? They call moose elk, but they don't call elk moose. Moose went extinct in England during the caveman lithic era. If an animal goes extinct in your country, you forfeit naming rights. That's the first rule of science. Besides, it wasn't an elk who saved both our country's asses multiple times from the Russians. It was a moose and squirrel. Moose shed their entire spork horns every year. It takes too much blood to keep them things on, so come wintertime, they just pop off. The thing about moose is they need to eat 100 pounds of baby trees, flowers, weeds, and pond scum a day. So that tastes gross. To add some seasoning, moose lick rock salt off of roadways. And when that starts to suck, they just kamikaze themselves onto oncoming traffic. The moose's huge schnozola allows it to scuba dive. And that's why along with Siberian tiger, gray wolf, and brown bear, a top predator of moose are killer whales. But moose's worst enemy is the winter tick. One moose can have 80 million ticks on it. 70% of moose calves get sucked off to death before they even turn one. And those who survive are called ghost moose because they scratch their skin off and haunt the forest like zombies. And while moose stock has been down worldwide since the 90s, 
I predict we'll see gains toward the end of this quarter in Canadian and Asian markets. B minus. Also, I can't believe I went this whole episode without mentioning moose knuckles. And I mean, if that's what your balls or pussy look like through your pants, respect. Today we're grading the Hickory Tiger Moth. Scary ass beetle team, moth team, meadow level, East Coast USA. This guy starts life as a cute fuzzy white caterpillar. Your girlfriend might even see this caterpillar on a tree and say, oh my God, that's so cute, let me go pick it up. How your relationship is going will determine your next actions. For the hickory tiger moth contains a mild venom that causes very annoying rashes. So if you don't like your girlfriend, obviously do nothing. Like you win this round. But if you love your girlfriend, as I imagine many of you do, immediately tackle her before she reaches caterpillar first down. Be a hero. The thing about the hickory tiger moth is they get to be two different things, a gross worm and a wannabe butterfly. Still, why we can't go into a cocoon and transform into another animal remains one of the great mysteries of science. These caterpillars get their venomous powers from the trees they constantly strip leaves from. And for whatever reason, the trees just let it slide. I guess the trees make extra leaves just for the caterpillars. Obviously F, but feel free to use your own grade depending on how it affects your relationship. Today we're grading the Peregrine Falcon. Team Clawbirds, Team Go Birds, Diverse Biome Sector, Worldwide, baby. The Peregrine Falcon, AKA Duck Hawk, AKA Bullet Hawk, world's most widespread raptor. But who is the Peregrine Falcon, really? This bird's a lover as much as a fighter. Peregrine Falcons mate for life. They know how good it feels to be perched up in a scrape cliffside with wifey. And peregrine falcons are dimorphic. Girls are 30% bigger than guys. But ask any guy peregrine falcon and they'll tell you. Bigger in all the right places. Peregrine falcons process the world at 200 frames a second in native 84K raw files. And they have pretty good storage for bird brains. That's why 3,000 years ago in Central Asia, they were smart enough to link up with humans. This little falcon teamed up wolf style with nomadic tribesmen who at the time couldn't hunt for shit. From there, a symbiotic relation between raptors and humans began that spread worldwide. By Game of Thrones times, the peregrine was known in OG falconry zines as the Emperor of Falcons. Fast forward to modern times. US agriculture's second huge fuck up after the Dust Bowl was right after World War II when they showered our crops in DDT and other wrestling move pesticides. This nearly holocausted peregrine falcons. But in a rare moment of somehow giving a shit about the environment, they banned DDT in 1970 and protected the birds. By 1999, peregrine falcons bounced back hard and even started occupying city biomes. In fact, it wouldn't be out of the ordinary for you to look out of your Bronx apartment window and see a peregrine falcon tearing the skull off a pigeon. And here's somebody who knows better about the topic. What's up everybody, Jason Ward here, host of Birds of North America. So the thing about peregrine falcons is that they're super high velocity killing machines, right? So they're capable of flying at 240 miles per hour and their only purpose in doing that is balling up their talons and punching the fuck out of anything that flies in their way. Yes. I'm talking about you, brown pelicans, great blue herons. Matter of fact, all of your favorite birds have probably been punched once or twice by a peregrine falcon. They're the best bird ever. A plus, Esto Perpetua. Today we're grading the Arapaima. Team Arowana, Team Arapaima, river level, Amazon River. I'd say I'm pretty objective when it comes to grading animals, but I already know Arapaima's grades are going off the charts. Weird ass dino fish are my favorite animals. It's well known in the scientific community that circle and oval type fishes suck. Meanwhile, the Arapaima's body shape is sick. Arapaima, Arapaima Standard, Arapaima Gigas, Arapaima Jazzmaster, even their small scale cousin Arowana has one of the best fish designs in history. Arapaima are an invasive species in India, but only because there was a flood and Arapaima escaped from a fish tank. So I don't really think that invasiveness counts. Plus, I'm already cutting a deal with them at the end of this episode. Arapaima breathe air and have a Kevlar bulletproof jacket style armoring not even piranha can bite through. So if you're a piranha, go fuck yourself. The thing about Arapaima is their mouth brooders. After they fertilize the eggs, they take the whole omelet in their mouth 
and keep the babies there until they're ready to fend for themselves. You gotta really want kids to do that. Due to overfishing, they can't grow 15 feet long in the wild anymore, which sucks. But one thing's for sure, arapaima are a zillion times better than the sturgeon, a huge waste of time prehistoric fish. A plus. Today we're grading the pangolin. Team prehistoric bullshit anteaters that have no modern classification, team pangolins. Savannah level, forest level, jungle level, Africa, Indonesia, and Asia, but take 80% off going extinct sale. Pangolins are eight different surviving species of an evolutionary branch to nowhere. With zero team affiliations, if not for their long-standing membership in the termite pals, they'd have no friends in the animal community at all. The thing about pangolins is they walk on two legs, hunched over, scanning the ground for bugs like an old man who lost his contact lens. Also, they can roll up into a ball, if you think that's cool. Pangolins are a large part of a major class action lawsuit against the Pokemon Corporation. Pangolins, along with giant deep sea isopod, red panda, slow loris, and megapode, claim Pokemons are posers who don't actually care about the missing link animal scene. Some people say pangolins and not bats created COVID-19. Here's what really happened. For years, pangolins were touring the scene developing the virus. When a bat came to one of their shows, they bought pangolins COVID-19 demo tape and flew back to the cave to put together a copy bat boy group. And using their flying distribution capabilities, bats outsold pangolins at the very same eating weird animals to get your dick hard markets of China. But don't worry, pangolins aren't out the game. When you spend your whole life giving anthills rim jobs, you're gonna carry more than a few viruses. Cultivirus, Pestivirus, Dongyang pangolin virus, and Li Shui pangolin virus featuring Amelomia Javanese nymph chick. So 9.0, best new pandemic, C minus, useless fucked up weirdo animal. Today we're grading the dugong. Team cows, team sea cows, seagrass level, splattered across Indonesia featuring coasts of India and Africa. Dugongs were the original mermaids. During the age of exploration, pirates kept dugongs in the ship hold and took turns fucking it. And what dugongs lack in looking like a mermaid they gain in having an exceptionally human-style vagina. The thing about dugongs is the guys have three-inch tusks that they use to fatly argue over who has fucking rights. What I don't understand is how in this competitive-ass natural world, dugongs didn't go extinct back in the Eocene. I mean, Stellar Sea Cow, the 30-foot dugong who legend has it could take the whole squad at once, was discovered in 18-something or other and hunted to extinction within the week. Even now, Dugongs are still getting poached for their whale fat, as well as getting bonked on the head by ships. But they don't have many natural predators. They just give up the ass to killer whales or whoever's toughest in exchange for a ocean prison bitch protection arrangement. Honestly, fuck manatees. Or make love to manatees. F plus. Today we're grading the giant toad. Team frogs, team frogs, jungle level, Central and South America, and a pinch of Indonesia and Australia. For some reason, scientists scientifically named this guy Marine Toad. Meanwhile, this toad never set foot near the ocean. What they should have called him was Fat Ass Toad. Because this toad is a humongous fuck who puts so much in its mouth in one sitting that it literally can't move. They even evolved extra folds in their stomach to stuff more animals in there. The giant toad lays four million billion trillion eggs at a time. Cause it's like, fuck my kids, I'm trying to put this entire boa constrictor in my mouth. These things get almost a foot long, but their fatness adds a whole nother level of in-person girth. The thing about the giant toad is it has two poisonous glands on the side of its head. And because it uses all its brains for swallowing shit, it has no control over the poison. So when the giant toad eventually gets chomped by a predator, the poison oozes out in a thick girl cum viscosity, killing whoever gets creamed in the mouth. When people found out about their swallowing ways, they hired giant toad as sugarcane plantation watch frogs, which immediately backfired when the giant toad went invasive. Classic Mr. Toad. The thing about this episode is I forgot to grade the giant toad, so... C plus. Today we're grading the American chestnut. T 
Team Beach, Team Chestnut, functionally extinct. But a hundred years ago, four billion trees towered over every eastern forest in America. American Chestnut, the East Coast Redwood, a prehistorically gigantic tree whose shitloads of delicious and nutritious chestnuts fed every living thing in the east half of America for millions of years. And so it was until a hundred years ago when a mysterious pandemic came and genocided the entire species within 40 years. But who really killed the American chestnut? We did. It was us, humans. In the 1870s, humans brought Asian chestnut trees from a ship to Long Island because we were trying to be little fancy Victorian era assholes. This was the first time Asian chestnuts had seen American chestnuts since cave people transported their seeds across the land bridge during whenever the fuck that happened. When the Asian chestnuts saw how good their American cousin was doing, they got jealous and infected them with a deadly pandemic fungus called chestnut blight. It starts as a disgusting canker sore, and using this shit called oxalic acid eventually chokes the tree out with a 100% kill rate. The chestnut blight pandemic really started to pop off in 1904, and by the end of World War II, every single chestnut all the way down to Mississippi got murked. People started bugging. They tried crossbreeding, putting condoms on the trees. One guy even put the chestnuts in a nuclear reactor to get them to mutate into ninjas. But it wasn't until 1993, when scientists successfully cloned dinosaurs, that people were like, yo, we can do that with trees. As of the year 2020, Genetics Bros finally developed a new American chestnut, Darling 58. Apparently, all the tree needed to defend itself against the pandemic was a pinch of oxalate oxidase, some basic ass spice found in most plants. The thing about the American chestnut is it has a sick leaf design. Check this out. Got these canoe spliff leaves with the dentata spikes. When the chestnuts come out, they're encased in hairy balls, and the catkins give it a little tropical feel. These guys grew humongously, had nice ass wood, and fed everybody for a year. I'm starting to figure out what really happened. Okay, any school child can tell you that the trees communicate through an underground mycorrhizal network known as the Internet of Shrooms. And it's there only to warn other trees about impending threats. And if all these other plants had this easily accessible juice they could have told the chestnut to synthesize, how come in 50 years none of their tree homies ever picked up a shroom and made the call? And ever since all the chestnuts died, who do you think went in and took their place? Oaks, maples, and all the other trees that stabbed chestnut in the back. Honestly, I'm not trying to take sides in the tree mafia turf war. I'm just saying, if you used your mushroom internet for something besides tree porn, maybe you wouldn't need humans to solve root rot, citrus greening, Dutch elm disease, hemlock woolly aged, emerald ash borer, sudden oak death, or the 25 other pandemics that we started that are killing you guys. I want to give an A, just because I'm hyped off the first chapter of Overstory, but since they're still currently extinct, I'm going to change that to an F. And as soon as I can get my hands on these new GMO Super Soldier Franken chestnuts, I'm going to upgrade the American chestnut back to IRL. Today we're grading the American Goldfinch. Team Tweety Birds, Team Finches, Meadow Level, straight up occupying North America. When society chopped down 98% of American forests, most birds figured they could fix the problem by non-stop tweeting about it. So, the heath hen, slender-billed curlew, Labrador duck, Carolina parakeet, seaside sparrow, Bachman's warbler, and many more all went extinct as hell. American goldfinches adapted and became VIP status at bird feeders across America. Unlike other Tweety birds who gang up on crows and shit on them so their feathers get fucked up and they die, American goldfinches aren't racist. Goldfinch couples stick together to raise the babies, but the guys don't help at all when it comes to building a nest. The girls weave the nest so tight that when it rains, it fills with water and the little chickies sometimes drown. So honestly, maybe the male bird does need to step in just to make sure the nest is OSHA compliant. You see, the thing about American goldfinches is that they're beautiful. Almost too beautiful, if you ask me. They attain that beautiful, bright yellow coat by eating a diet consisting of 140% seeds. They're vegetarians, and they're just as smug as vegetarians are as well. They're judging us. So the American goldfinch is doing all right. Can't say the same for the European goldfinch, 
who are being wiped off the face of the earth in drift nets, glue traps, and other grindhouse murder techniques along with every other Tweety bird in Eastern Europe. Five billion birds a year die in poaching mafia hits, all for this dish called Ambulapulia, which means disgusting boiled Tweety bird you eat whole to make your dick hard. And look, I've tried it and it doesn't work. Well, thank God American goldfinches don't have to deal with that shit. B plus.